start recording. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Um, this is Frank with the EMEA v. Brownback. And today we have Sam joining us to actually present uh, on Objective 2. And Sam basically is an expert for cloudy stuff. Um, he recently passed his um, VCDX CMA. Um, so this one should be good. Over to you, Sam. Uh, thanks very much, Frank. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, not really much more to say about that. I work as a senior consultant doing uh, cloud automation and stuff. Um, if you want to connect with me, my my uh, Twitter details at the bottom there. But um, let's uh, let's get on with this objective two. Um, we'll jump straight into the the blueprint for that. So. Uh, if I can work out why my slideshow is not resumed. While we are this waiting for the minor technical issues to be resolved, if there's any question, folks, um, just use the questions panel, and I'll relay them to some to be answered in due course. There we go. Thanks, Frank. Sorry about that. Um, it seems I can't work PowerPoint. I can build clouds, but not work PowerPoint. Um, so uh, this is just a snippet from the uh, the blueprint. Uh, as you can see, objective two is not section two. Objective one and two two. Cover. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through these, and then um, and then we'll demo actually going through some of these on a on a visualize. Uh, installation um, and uh, yeah, we'll see how we'll see how long that takes. Um, so uh, yeah, two two main objectives: create roles and apply privileges to roles, and configure AD slash LDAP integration. Um, really, the second objective is mostly covered by setting up the first objective. Um, you have the add identity stores uh, covering and then configure identity stores. Um, very similar sort of setups. So um, We'll see that as we go through. Um, so if we skip next to the uh, the first section, um, configure system-wide roles and responsibilities, assign user roles within tenants, configure tenant roles and responsibilities, add identity stores, and appoint tenant administrators. Um, so if we jump into the uh, configuring system-wide roles and responsibilities, effectively there are three uh, my PowerPoint's gone funny. Uh, there, are, there are basically three uh, system-wide roles that we can we can look at. There's the system administration role, um, which is basically going to be the user that you use to uh, install. Um, at, uh, I'll just give me one second, my notes have gone. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, Actually, I'll, you, you can have a look at this while I'm while I'm sorting it out. This is um, this is a mind map. I do a lot of mind mapping to help me uh, learn things, and this is a mind map that I've created to help me learn all of the roles within VRA. Um, and as a sort of quick reference, um, so uh, that's something I can share uh, later on. But um, let me just so just sort of interest. What software are you using for the uh, for the mind maps then? Uh, software called Simple Mind. Um, I actually paid for it. Um, it's, a, it's a paid license. Um, it's very good. Uh, I am, um, yeah. I, I think it's one of the, one of the. I tried quite a few sort of free open, open source and all that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, Simple Mind. Uh, it's got a good sort of iOS client, so you can do it on your tablet and your phone. Um, so it's good for sort of note taking when you're in sessions and things like that as well. Um, Plus studying for a VCP. <laughs> you studying the VCPs. I've got a VCDX one. I've got um, all sorts. So um, yeah, uh, I use it all the time, really. Okay, we're back on. I have my notes. Um, so system administrator is typically the person who installs the realize uh, responsible for ensuring its availability for other users. 
Um, so this is effectively your administrator at vSphere.local. Um, the, they they create the uh, the tenant they manage um, system defaults uh, branding uh, notification providers uh, they're responsible for system wide logs um, reviewing system wide logs and um, also in in a in a sort of single tenant uh, deployment the same person is actually going to be the the tenant administrator as well and um, so so by default this system administrator is is um, has the keys to the kingdom and can be you can use the single user to, to manage everything. Not that that's a recommendation, um, it's just uh, it, that's what happens by default unless you separate the roles out. Uh, the second sort of system wide uh, administrator role is the uh, infrastructure admin, or I've got it there as IAS admin, as, as a shortened uh, thing. Uh, basically, they, this, uh, this admin will manage things like the endpoints, so your vSphere endpoints, orchestrator endpoints. Uh, the credentials for those endpoints, uh, they will create fabric groups, um, configure things like uh, the proxy agents, um, the, all, the, all the sort of service accounts for physical machines and uh, storage devices as well, and also they will ha have a, a role log in, uh, monitoring the logs that are specific to the IAS layer. Um, the final of the system-wide roles is the fabric group admin or fabric administrator. Um, and th this role is basically the administrator of a single or more than one uh, fabric group um, and is to manage the physical resources and compute resources within the fabric group, uh, the reservations and the reservation policies that are applied on those resources. Um, they manage the build profiles, uh, machine prefixes, property dictionaries uh, that are used across all the, all the tenants and business. Um, so uh, that's... Uh, there can be a little bit of confusion with roles. Um, uh, for example, the infrastructure admin role is when when you create a, a, a identity source within a tenant, you can actually assign a an, an infrastructure admin role. That infrastructure admin role actually is given access. It's a system wide access. Um, but it's obviously been configured at a tenant level. So one thing to bear in mind with these roles is they are all system wide, even though you can configure the infrastructure admin at a tenant group level. Um, so the, the, re the reason for that is that um, if you've got multiple identity sources within different tenants, um, you may want to be configuring an infrastructure admin from a tenant that doesn't have an identity source in your default because they've got local tenant. Um, and so you need to authenticate someone from a different source, um, but within within that uh, that source to, to manage the infrastructure. Um, sounds as clear as mud when you say it like that. Um, so the uh, the next uh, section is um, is about creating roles and applying privileges to roles. Now that's the title. Is about assigning user roles within tenants. This covers quite a few sections actually. Um, assigning user roles within tenants, configuring tenant roles and responsibilities, and also appointing tenant administrators. This is all, all to do with the roles that are actually part of the tenant. Um, so um, within within each tenant, uh, you have the identity sources, and any any user that is authenticated. Uh, via the identity source within a tenant is is considered a user within be realized um, so that that can be literally anyone that is authenticated against that you don't actually have to put any specific privileges on the, a user they can log in if they are authenticated by the identity source so um, that although that's not a specific role um, it's neat to understand that anyone that can authenticate can be a user within the uh, environment um, tenant specific roles, you have a tenant administrator, um, they're assigned by the system administrator when you create a tenant um, and uh, you can also add uh, someone to the tenant admin role under uh, the users and groups which we'll look at that later. Um, but then it's worth noting that you, there's a couple of places where you, a couple of opportunities. The first one is when you create a tenant, the second one is when you, when you uh, manage the users and groups. Um, you can add the tenant admin role. Um, uh, there are uh, business groups. So when you create a business group, the uh, 
Well, actually, I'll, let's go. Let's go service architect next. The so service architect is basically assigned by the uh, the ten by the tenant admins, and uh, will manage uh, the uh, service roles. So um, advanced services, things like that. Um, the business group manager uh, is and support users. They're created when you when you create a business group. Um, the group manager is responsible for managing the uh, the group membership and things like that. The support user is someone who can go in and, and modify um, requests and, uh, and assist members of the business group. Um, approval admins uh, they're assigned. Uh, by a tenant administrator under the users of groups. Again, you can sign that role to uh, to manage approval policies, uh, and then of course the approver, who is someone who can approve roles, um, they're also assigned under the tenant admin uh, under users and groups. Um, so, um, and I'm just just rattling through this a bit because it makes much more sense when you actually go through uh, the interface and actually look at where where things are configured. Uh, just just a quick one there on the um, differences, especially between um, vRealize automation and um, vCloud Director. So you mentioned the um, the tenant and the fabric admin are actually system-wide roles, right? Um, yes. Do, do you just quickly want to describe how that differentiates um, on the actual roles and permissions in, in vCloud Director? <laughs> um. Uh, well, uh, are you thinking in a specific? Yeah, the, the well, so, so you think in the sort of the complete isolation that you get with? Yeah, with the the multi-tenancy concepts within VRA and um, VCD are a bit different, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. So um, you, with with VCD, you're talking a sort of completely isolated um, tenant. Uh, it's completely logically isolated. There's no, there's no sort of crossover. Um, I think the the tenant admin uh, is is the king of the tenant within VRA, um, but I think it's the inf the infrastructure and the fabric admins are the ones that sort of cross over the boundaries, and they're the system wide roles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. So uh, it can be a big issue if you're. In NVCloud Director, if, if you take the concept there and the org admin is managing the, the hardware, right, um, it will have zero impact on on other um, on other orgs. Uh, while in vRealize Automation, if your fabric admin does something not very smart, it might actually impact other tenants as well. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, um, so we're looking at the next slide is, is about adding identity stores. Um, they can be configured by the system admin um, who uh, obviously creates the, uh, the tenants and, and on, on tenant creation you can configure those, those identity stores. Uh, it also, also can be added by the, uh, the tenant administrator. They can go in and configure new identity stores, manage the existing ones. Um, you can use uh, Active Directory or Open LDAP as as identity sources, and we'll, we'll go through a configuration of one of them in a little, a little while. The um, the native Active Directory um, that's that's an interesting one because uh, the the the, uh, the recommended sort of model for um, tenancy is to keep your your default tenant uh, clean as clean as possible and just use it as a sort of administrative. Um, what, uh, an administrative tool, um, but that's the only tenant that can use native Active Directory, um, which which seems to me to be a, a little bit of a, uh, uh, a little bit pointless if you can only use native Active Directory on the default tenant. Um, but obviously there there are good reasons for that. I just hopefully one 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 day there'll be uh, more capability for native Active Directory. Um, That covers most of 2.1. Um, 2.2 two, uh, is basically saying configure identity stores. Well, uh, we, we'll have a look at actually doing that in a minute. Um, 
but it's it's so simple. I'm not sure why it's been split out into into a second objective. Um, associating an identity store with a tenant. Um, again, that that's sort of fairly intuitive, and we'll we'll look at that in a second. And then configuring the Active Directory, Native Active Directory identity store. Um, again. Uh, you, it's so simple that I don't understand why it's broken out into a whole separate objective. Um, so, we, but we'll, we'll, we'll look through all of those parts anyway. So, um, I'm going to go on to a, a bit of a demo now. Um, hopefully, I get the tech right this time. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I've got some some pre-staged groups and some pre-staged users. Um, at the moment, the only one with any any uh, configuration is is the administrator at vSphere.local, and that's that's the managing that, that's the system admin account that that's created on installation. Um, there is some configuration in my default tenant, um, but we're going to we're going to create a new tenant and, and just whiz through some of those pieces. So um, I shall just get rid of that and bring up. So th this is this is my um, vRealize lab that I've built on Ravello, um, which uh, is just sort of cloud cloud-based lab platform, um, which I'm sure most people are aware of. Uh, so on this uh, this setup, I'm now logging into the the default tenant, and we'll. Uh, So when, when we log in, we'll see it's a, it's a pretty vanilla installation at this point in time. We have just my default vSphere.local tenant. Um, and uh, what I've done is I'll just brought, bring up these again. Um, we'll go through and actually, as I, um, as I sort of check off these demonstrations, we'll, we'll, we'll put some little circles by the things that we've actually done. Um, first of one I'm going to actually look at is to configure a native Active Directory identity store. As I said before, this is only one that you can do on the default tenant. Um, so uh, in, in preparation for this, you need your SSO to have joined the domain. So whatever's providing your SSO, I'm using the uh, identity appliance. The identity appliance isn't supported really for production environments other than sort of proof and concept. So um, most people won't be using a, a, a identity appliance in, as their primary SSO. Um, your other options are to have uh, a vSphere 5.5 SSO um, and or uh, the uh, PSC, so the vSphere 6 PSC, Platform Services Controller setup as SSO. Um, both of those can be installed on Windows roles, and if the Windows server is a member of the domain, then it will obviously be domain joined, and you've got the option to do Active Directory integrated. Um, with the Platform Services Controller, if you're deploying the appliance, um, you can actually use AD join. Uh, a command line tool to join the platform services controller, and that gives you the uh, the sort of um, domain joined uh, computer account that's used for integrated authentication. Um, but it, you should know that it is a sort of prerequisite to be able to do um, the AD integrated, is that your machine is a member of the domain. Um, and to stand some reason, things like the the domain name it needs to be a member of that DNS domain. Um, as well, otherwise it's not going to be able to resolve things. Um, and the configuration within VRA is really very simple. Um, when you're looking at the, the default tenant, the identity stores, um, it literally is. I've, so I've got one configured there because um, it, it, you can't actually move it out. But it's, it's a case of selecting native Active Directory, sticking in a name for it. And I think that is the only configuration that you actually need to do when you're in, uh, and you can put an alias in as well, um, but that's the only configuration. So there's no username, password, there's no base search or anything like that to be configured. Um, and when we actually look at this one, you can see it's picked up uh, lab.local is the domain name. Um, the identity source name is what I put in there, which is lab.local. Everything else 
is configured, and actually I can't configure anything else. There's no uh, configurable options there. So adding adding an Active Directory integrated uh, source, identity store, is really really simple. Uh, I'm going to give that a uh, going to give that a nice red circle there, just to remind me that I've done that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add a new tenant, call it the brown bag, uh, and I'll stick the brown bag as the URL, and we're going to configure uh, an AD identity store. Uh, I don't actually have LDAP available. We could do it as LDAP um, calling um, to Active Directory. Um, but uh, it's literally a case of putting in the details of your um, Active Directory domain controller. So mine is dc.lab.local. Um, the port, um, whether it's SSL or you can, so you can use LDAP S as well, but um, I'm just just using basic LDAP over 389. The domain is, is your DNS name if you're domain, so that's lab local. Uh, the DNS alias, uh, domain alias, sorry, is, is quite cool. That's um, uh, whatever you put in here, you can use it as your sign-on. So um, if my username is Sam at lab .local, uh, and I put lab in here as the alias, I can sign in using Sam at lab. So the domain alias can be quite useful for um, users who can't remember long DNS names as there. So if you've got like corp.domain.org.local or something as your, then you don't want users to have to type that in. You can use the uh, the alias um, to, to give a shorter login. That's quite cool. Um, the DN is the, uh, the distinguished name of a user that you're going to use to authenticate. Um, I've pre-copied mine there because um, I don't want to faff around typing it in, um, but I've just got a service account, which is which I'm using to authenticate the RA um, the password for that service account. Um, the group uh, group search based the end. Basically, the identity store is going to look up based on this uh, this uh, folder RU that you place in there. So if you give a distinguished name of, um, let's pull up. This is my my Active Directory in this sense, and I've got um, I'm, I'm using this lab OU, and under this lab OU, I've got users, and I've got my setup users, and I've got groups, and I've got the groups that I've set up. Um, so for this demo, I'm just going to stick lab as my um, as my source for um, both the group search and the user search. You can you could go a level further down and stick the the group search in there and the user search. Uh, in the user OU in there just to, to lock it down even more. I'm, I'm in the lab. I'm happy to just do it in this little lab. Um, so that's that's a Active Directory uh, configuration, that, and I can test that connection. And it says it couldn't connect. That's always good. Hold up. Password. Yeah, put the wrong password in. Excellent. So that is configuring an identity store. Um, that's configuring an Active Directory identity store. So let's, let's put a one, that little circle there. Um, you can also configure an open LDAP uh, connection, and m much the same way you, know, you configure the, the connection and test it. And uh, but I'm going to have an open LDAP available to me here to test. Um, moving on from that, we so uh, we're still in the process of creating a tenant here. So you can see up here, we're still in the add tenant uh, wizard. Uh, if you try and click on these, really annoyingly, you, it looks like there are tabs, but you can't. Yeah, you have to click next. Um, so this section where we can appoint our tenant administrators. That's again another one of our our um, uh, configure tenant configure tenant roles and responsibilities or assign user roles within tenants um, and appoint the tenant administrators. It probably covers all three of those. Um, I'm going to use a group 
that I know I've got preset up. This is an Active Directory group called Tenant Administrators. The first time you search under a new identity source, it can take a few seconds. If you've got a huge um, data source, um, a huge Active Directory, thousands and thousands of users, um, it can take much longer. Um, that's when using that, that sort of narrower search within your identity uh, identity source can actually help you reduce the, uh, the amount of time you're searching and caching stuff. Um, but I'm going to go with tenant administrators. Where's it gone? We are a tenant admins. Uh, and remember, I said that you can appoint infrastructure administrators from a tenant. Um, and so you're appointing a system wide role here from the creation of a tenant. Um, Fortunately, you can only do this as a system admin. You can't create tenants as a non-system admin. Um, so, but it's just something to be aware of that you are adding uh, a, a system-wide role from the configuration of a tenant. Um, so, I'm going to. I've got. Uh, yeah, I've got another pre-staged group for you of infrastructure admins. And. That then creates my new V Brown Mag uh, tenant. Um, let me jump back there. So I've appointed a tenant administrator, um, configuring some system wide roles and responsibilities. Um, we're, we're not quite there with the system wide one because let's. I'm now going to log in using uh, that infrastructure admin account that I've just appointed. So I'm going to log out and really uh, creative for the names. It's going to be infrastructure.admin at lab. Now remember I said I could use at lab because I've created the alias uh, rather than doing at lab.local. Um, but I could do, I could have put an alias of anything I wanted um, and that would then allow me to log on using that. Ah, but by, by deliberate mistake, um, I've logged on now using the default URL, which is my default tenant. I've logged into vsphere.local. I only configured the infrastructure.admin or the infrastructure group as an admin, uh, an infrastructure admin under the the new tenant that I've created. So this is going to be no good because I don't have any rights under the vsphere.local tenant. Uh, so I'm now going to log in. I've got a bookmark here for the V brown bag, so uh, I don't know if you can see that, but that's uh, four slash VCAC, four slash org, four slash V brown bag. It's the name of the tenant that I created. Um, and now if I log on using the infrastructure admin account, good if you type things right. I know I'm dicing with death playing with a, a live lab here, but these things always go. Okay, so infrastructure admin has the infrastructure uh, tab, and we can see that these are the various infrastructure um, settings that I can configure. Um, I'll just wait for that to load. Um, Okay, so the next step that we're going to go through is to create a fabric admin, or create a fabric group and and assign an admin to that just to, to demonstrate the uh, the administration. So I, I have a pre-existing fabric group, and we could edit that quite easily, um, but I may as well create a new fabric group just so we can see that, that process. Um, so I should call it Free Brown Bag. Fabric group, um, and similarly, I can look up my. I've created pre-staged a um, fabric administrators group, um, and that is configuring a system-wide role, the fabric admin's role, to be able to administer this fabric group, um, and ticking the computer resources just assigns that that um, those resources to this fabric group. Um, and that is literally that. So we're actually 
ticking off uh, another another system wide roles and responsibilities there. Um, that's that one of the three uh, fabric elements group. And you can see here um, this Ravello lab actually doesn't have any fabric administrators assigned um, because I've been putting stuff in and pulling it out and adding and removing identity sources basically. Um, so this is how you would add fabric administrator to an existing fabric group. Um, you could actually just you could actually just re-add in when you edit the group, and I'll add that fabric admins group back in. Just from from the workflow process, um, if if you just quickly open that um, edit window again, um, for either of the groups. What, what you see yeah. there in the bottom is the compute resources. So essentially, from from a logical from scratch install, you'd rather be setting up the uh, the endpoints first, right? Yeah. So um, more in, as I mentioned, there was some some uh, configuration already done to this environment, just so that I could um, rather than rather than step through all of the the initial configuration that you have to do in adding adding the endpoints, it would have just blown out the demo to take quite a lot of time. Yeah. So um, there, there there are there are things like the the, the you know the the, the, the um, endpoints are already configured. They've collected um, data and they and I've created compute resources um, and uh, various other sort of components. There's things like I've I've already created. Um, Default prefixes and things like that, so that we can just whiz through the demo a bit quicker. Um, so, yeah, I should probably should have mentioned that at the beginning. I said it was fairly vanilla, but there is some configuration to do. Yeah. So, just just from the point of view of, of just demonstrating what's in the uh, in the blueprint at that point, I've um, I've got I've pre-staged some stuff. Um, so. Uh, I'll just very quickly log on as that fabric admin. Just so we can see that there's a difference in the users now. So as, as a fabric administrator, I can see the compute resources that are available to me. Um, that local thing, I can, I can Create reservations, manage manage all those roles that are actually under the fabric admin. Uh, where are we? So the fabric administrator here. We have uh, all all of these uh, tasks that are available to the fabric administrator: managing reservations, cost profiles, build profiles, network profiles, the machine prefixes that I mentioned before. I'd actually pre-staged those machine prefixes just so that it's. Uh, 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 it's quicker for the demo, but um, it's all very simple to configure that 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 system-wide role. Um, let's uh, right. okay. Uh, so yeah, this is so this is this is the fabric admin role, and you can see that um, uh, on the reservations, the, there's the the different aspects that you can. So, for example, I've got some network profiles created already. Um, I haven't got any reservation properties. Or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, no, it's not important. That's that's the role has been assigned correctly. Um, so, this is still logging into the V Brown Bag tenant um, because that's where I've configured all of these these users. Um, so, the tenant admin role. Is, is been assigned to the, the, the so the tenant admin role administrator role has been assigned to that tenants group um, which, of which this user is, is part of. So we'll log in as a tenant administrator, and we can quickly flick to my uh, my map, and you can see that the, the tenant administrator has quite a lot of responsibilities. Um, this, the, the tenant administrator is, is, is roles extend to the whole of the tenant, um, it, it can't administrate anything outside of the tenant, um, but it is God within the tenant, um, and uh, things like creating and publishing shared group blueprints, um, managing all the groups, creating uh, business groups, which is which is an absolute um, key 
part of the uh, the user model is is to create the, the, the business groups. Um, so that's that's now logged in, and what we're actually going to do is we'll, we'll create a new business group, um, which is under the infrastructure tab, groups, business groups. Um, so a business group might be a department, um, a specific department within your uh, organisation. Um, I've seen people use business groups in all sorts of ways. It basically, um, it, it gives you a sort of broken down, a smaller, more manageable unit that you can you can allocate. Um, you can allocate support on that particular group. You can allocate managers, uh, approvals, all that sort of thing within that that um, tenant. So. Um, is that, is that slide still there? So basically, so, you, um, you the, can use a business group to subdivide a tenant by departments yes. or logical functions. Then? Yeah, that's exactly it. So um, where you see on this slide, I have I've just got a single business group, and within that business group, you've got a business group manager and support users. You also actually have users within that business group, and that's how you assign um, people to to business groups. Um, but we'll, we'll see that when I when I create it. But you can you can take that business group uh, and have multiple business groups within a single tenant. This it allows you to sort of separate out departments, maybe different functionality for different uh, groups, have assigned managers to specific groups of people. Um, so yeah, it, it allows you to sort of logically, logically subdivide tenants. Um, I'm just going to create a new business group because it's, it's a very simple um, thing. Surprise, surprise, we'll, we'll call it the brown bag business group. Um, so I mentioned before that um, I, I pre staged the, the default machine prefix um, is very imaginative. It goes lab 0001. Um, but I'll assign that prefix. Um, you can configure the Active Directory container for this business group so that that, um, that sets up the property that allows you to do things like move servers into the specific business group um, later on um, or when you're creating, if you're creating Active Directory users through um, advanced services or through VRO, you can you can play, use that property to place them in the correct container. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, but I don't think it actually does anything uh, other than set a property out of the box. Yeah, that should uh, be correct. Yeah. Um, so here, um, the, this is where we're getting into the. Um, assign user roles within tenants and configure tenant roles and responsibilities. Um, the group manager role is that is the is the, is the person who's responsible for this particular um, business group. If we flip back to my um, mind map, so this is this is basically my memory. Um, the business group manager here um, has these responsibilities, so uh, publishing blueprints within the business group, managing catalog items and entitlements, and monitoring resource usage within the business group. I I really like that mind map, especially uh, for that part. What really threw me off are uh, the first times I logged into the um, hands-on lab at VMware, uh, in the VMware hands-on labs to just study for some stuff in VRA. Um, I, I logged in with the business group manager, and I didn't see any any blueprints I could deploy. And um, that's simply because the manager isn't set up as a user, right? So they are actually yeah. two different entities, and they have a separation of roles there. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the key within within VRA is actually you need to think about who you're providing these roles to. And and you, you can have someone who's a manager and a user. That's absolutely fine. That's permissible. Um, and quite often that's what you see is, is the person who manages the business group actually also consumes the bit the, the the catalogues and the, the templates that are available within that business group. Um, but it is something you would have to sort of expressly um, grant to that user. Um, so where am I? Business group managers. So I've pre-staged at business group managers. Um, send manager emails to now. Uh, alerting email alerting is configured on a on a per tenant basis, um, and that's something that um, the tenant administrator can configure. Yes. So this is, this is where my mind map is is my memory. 
um, tenant notifications here as part of the tenant admin role. Um, you can actually configure um, the, so the, the uh, email notifications and, and where the emails are sent by the tenant admin. Um, so uh, I'll just put it's not a real email address. Um, the, so the support role, um, this again is down here. Support user can basically request and manage services on behalf of other users. Um, so it literally is uh, the support user can go in and see what someone's done wrong and, and fix it in the request or, or uh, make sure that the request is configured correctly um, and do sort of day two operations on behalf of others. So it's a bit, it's a bit like a power user, um, really. It's, it's not got uh, administrative rights to configure anything really within the tenant, but it can help other people to, to get their requests correct. Uh, so, surprise, surprise, I've put an imaginatively named uh, support role group. And finally, the user role. Um, so, by default, you, uh, anyone who's authenticated by um, the identity source can log in. Um, but if you're using business groups to manage which services they, they're able to access, um, they will only be a, able to access those services when they're actually part of the business group. Um, so you, this is where you specify your, your users who are going to be part of the business group. Uh, I'm not just going to go tenant users group there. Um, and that is the creation of my new business group for B Brown Bag. Uh, okay. So if I just flip back to this, um, so we've, we've assigned some user roles within tenants. Uh, we're going to do a little bit more of that in a minute, uh, configuring tenant roles and responsibilities again. A little bit more of that, it, it's a little bit generic and there are lots of roles that we can assign and I'm going to show you how we do that in a moment. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, associate an identity store with a tenant. Um, I'm in as a tenant admin, and so I can come in and add a new identity store. I assume that's what they mean by associate an identity store with a tenant, um, because I don't know, and there isn't a, a identity store doesn't exist outside of a tenant, so um, it's not like it's an object you could then assign to another tenant or move between tenants. It is a property effectively of that tenant, um, so. That would be assigning uh, uh, assigning associate an identity store with a tenant. So I think I think that's fairly easily covered off, and we have configured identity stores. So the final sort of bit we'll look at is assigning user roles within tenants and tenant roles and responsibilities. Just, um, just we, before you jump back there in the lab, um, just from your real life experience as a cloud consultant. Um, yep. How much time do you actually spend with uh, with clients discussing the uh, role-based access, um, the level of access uh, throughout the um, throughout the environment uh, versus um, actually defining blueprints, etc.? Because I I'd imagine um, that uh, especially for more secure environments, that that's a considerable amount of time being spent on on that level of design already. Yeah, so it really depends on the maturity of the cloud adoption of the, of the client or the, the, the customer that we're working with. Um, if, if uh, like you say, they're, they're sort of you know, a big organization with lots of security requirements, um, primarily the first kind of conversation that happens is, is around um, the, the default tenant and whether you're going with a multi-tenancy model or whether you're going to use the default tenant. Um, now, as, as I said before, I alluded to the fact that it's recommended to sort of keep the, the default tenant as clean as possible and have it as an administrative um, area and then to create new tenants. Whether you create one new or multiple new tenants um, depends on how much separation you need between, for example, departments um, and that sort of thing. The, the conversation around the roles tends to um, it tends to come later on when they've 
when they're really a bit more um, uh, when, when they're a bit more mature in the adoption model. So what what I tend to see with with the engagements, uh, I'm answering this in a really slow manner. What I tend to see with engagements is that people have a proof of concept and they work out what they want to do within that proof of concept. So by the time you come to do a full cloud deployment, so distributed deployment, enterprise level stuff, they've generally got a good idea about who should be doing what. Um, whether that is it's not typically something that's separated out in most of the people that I've seen. Um, that they don't separate out the roles as much as I have here. Um, so someone who is the system administrator will also be the tenant administrator and the fabric administrator, and um, you know we'll, we'll be configuring most of the stuff that's normally for a few people within an IT department. Um, so, but it is it is a conversation that that can take a lot of time if if there's intense security requirements as well as um, sort of very large organisations. Um, so we will have a look. So configuring configuring the different users and roles. Um, the other interface that I've mentioned is, is this uh, users and groups interface. That's uh, that some of the so I'm logged into the as a tenant administrator role, um, and we can get to this rather confusingly blank users and groups thing. And the first time you see this, you sort of go, what? Surely there are more groups and users available for me to configure, um, but you actually need to search for them before you can do anything with them. Um, so, say for example, we have a group of people that we want to be um, uh, approvers. Um, now, to, to assign that role to them, we first need to find that group within the uh, the identity store. Um, so, as as you know, slightly <laughs> it's funny because it's slightly different to all the other interfaces, but we we'll, we search for that. Um, and it'll list them out here, and, and then I'll say, okay, I, I've got my my tenant approvers group here, and I'll go into this group, and I can actually look and see, oh yeah, I've got two users that are part of that group, um, and then I can I can look through and say, actually, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm talking the wrong thing here. The approvers. Are different to the approval administrators. The approval administrators are the people who can uh, configure the configure the approval policies. Um, the the, uh, the approvers are configured when you configure the service um, and the approval policy. So, for example, to add these tenant approvers here, I'm just adding the role of approval administrator. Oh, that's not actually the group that I want to add. I want to add approval admins, my, my oh so clever naming scheme, um, and then just to add that role, I can literally update that group, and that, that group now has the uh, the ability to edit those approval policies. Um, as you can see, that there are there are lots of different roles. This is the tenant admin role that I created before, and, and you can see that that role was already added in there. If, um, so these are these are all the the users and groups that are available from the identity store. Um, we can also create custom groups. These are these are effectively groups that are going to be stored um, within within SSO within VRA itself, rather than as an identity source. Um, and you can literally create a, create a custom group and assign roles. Uh, and and then assign members within that. So um, I'm not actually going to create one, but uh, I, I've never actually uh, had a customer that's required these custom groups. Um, almost all of them have used uh, Active Directory authentication, but it is worth knowing that these custom groups are available. And um, let's just stick a roll on it, and then we can add. Add a user or, or an existing group. Um, anyone I know of is users at V Brown Bag. So this is this is um, a default group that's created within that tenant. Um, so the tenant's created within the SSO, within the identity appliance, um, and users is a default group within that. So I'm, I could add that, for example. Um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to create that custom group because there's not much point really. But it's worth knowing that that's there, and you can you can add 
you can add not only um, users from the identity store, but custom groups and things like that too. Um, now, that does take me pretty much to the end of my notes. Um, so we've covered off uh, those roles within the tenants and the tenant roles and responsibilities. Um, as I said, it's, it's not a huge topic, it's just knowing which, which roles uh, provide which functionality and uh, you can trawl for hours through the documentation or I shall um, try and get this published um, and uh, we'll get a link to it in the notes for this. Frank, you can do that, can't you? Um, we can do that. If, if you just wouldn't mind, um, just quickly, so we have it in the recording as well, um, just zoom in on, on each and every admin again. Uh, just keep it for five to ten seconds and then go counterclockwise or clockwise to um, to see the uh, responsibilities of each and every role. Okay, well, we'll start with the system wide one. So you've got the system administrator, um, uh, it's typically the in, uh, initial installer. Um, they're responsible for tenant creation, the configuring of identity stores within that tenant um, and assigning tenant admins, uh, monitoring and logging within the uh, within that context, and also some system wide configuration like the branding and the notifications. Um, and this would basically uh, default to the administrator at vc.logo during install, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I honestly don't know how it would be another user because um, DRA doesn't support a different SSO, uh, default SSO, other than vc.logo, so th there's no way it could be yeah. anything different. Um, so uh, next system-wide one is that IAS administrator role. Um, they can create and manage endpoints, that's virtual endpoints, cloud endpoints, physical endpoints, and also managing the credentials that you use to connect to those endpoints. Uh, they can also create and manage fabric groups, uh, and also while they're doing that, they're assigning fabric administrators, um, configure proxy agents, uh, licensing, um, that's that's a key one. That that's. Um, will often catch people out if you actually need to log on as an IS administrator and push in the licensing for that. Um, also the logging for the IS components and uh, you can also configure AWS instant types if you're using your AWS as an endpoint. Uh, next role would be the fabric administrator. Um, so the fabric administrator um, effectively is, is managing you your access to the compute resources, um, machine prefixes, build profiles, uh, network profiles, cost profiles, reservations and reservation prop, uh, policies, um, the uh, the property dictionary as well is configured by the fabric administrator, and also you can manage Amazon EBS volumes and key pairs. Um, I'm not massively sure what Amazon EBS uh, key pairs are. Volumes and key pairs. <laughs> it's not something I've had much much contact with. Yeah. So um, so the logical order would basically you install the system, log in as a system admin, and provide uh, IAS and Fabric admin. Then you log yeah. in with the IAS admin, actually license the system, set up yeah. the set up the endpoints, um, go to the Fabric administrator if that's a different user, and then create those compute resources and the actual reservations before yeah. you uh, start doing the um, the tenant specific stuff right so that yeah. with those three users you've basically covered all the um, system wide options right there yeah, yeah. and and quite typically we'll see some most most typically we'll see those three roles combined in, into one user or one one person will be responsible for those roles, um, but it's worth knowing that you can have multiple fabric administrators responsible for different areas, so you could have, uh, I've had um, clients, uh, customers before where the design has multiple data centers and there's a, there's a vCenter server within each data center, and so the person responsible for that vCenter server became the fabric administrator. Um, which which managed that that compute endpoint so that the vSphere endpoint 
and, and manage the reservations and all that sort of things locally. Um, so it, it's it's quite useful from that point of view if, uh, if, if you've got different people responsible for different vSphere environments that you're using as endpoints, the Fabric admin actually has um, has the control over those endpoints. Um, it's it's a quite a good delegation really. Um, so moving on over to here, we've obviously got the tenant uh, in, the, in the centre of this one. This is all the all the tenant wide roles. Um, we'll skip up to the, the tenant administrator first of all. That's that's a role assigned when you when the tenant is created, or also it can be assigned in that users and groups. Um, there's a checkbox for the tenant administrator role. Um, their responsibilities, their um, key ones are things like they're, they're managing user and group roles, that's including uh, business groups which are your key subdivision um, of, the, of the tenant. Uh, they can configure tenant-wide uh, notification settings and the scenarios for those notifications. Uh, they can create and manage approval policies, they can manage the catalogue, uh, that's the catalogue items and also the services. Um, they can manage entitlements, actions, uh, this is quite a key one as well. They can configure uh, the orchestrator and advanced service designer. Um, that's something we see quite a lot um, is, is where a, a tenant will need to have a, a completely isolated orchestrator environment um, because for whatever reason they, they do uh, need to be separate. You can actually have um, a dedicated orchestrator instance or orchestrator cluster for uh, for a particular tenant. Um, that quite often in, in sort of high security environments they, they want that separation rather than having a shared one. Um, so they can create and publish shared blueprints, uh, branding, they can make it look pretty. Uh, and of course the, the tenant identity stores, they can they can go in and, and edit those identity stores, add, and remove and change. Um, what they can't do is if they can't remove the identity store that they're being authenticated for, um, because obviously that would cause a, a small paradox. Um, service architect um, is sort of the second most powerful role within the tenant. Uh, they can they can, they create and publish uh, anything as a service blueprint. So basically, when you're consuming uh, orchestrator workflows. Uh, through advanced services designer, they they, uh, they can figure that. Um, they can define custom resource types and custom actions. Um, there's not a huge amount more to be said um, around around the service architect role. It is typically a fairly specific role. I don't often see the service architect being different to a tenant admin, or quite often the tenant admin service architect and all the system-wide roles get combined um, depending on how large the organization is. Uh, so there are some application services roles um, they, they're, um, they're an area of weakness of mine shall we say. Um, I don't, don't know a huge amount about um, app services. Um, I've not really had much call to use it. Um, it's uh, if anyone's seen any of the, the, the VRA7 stuff, that's going to be really cool and a really huge part of it. Um, but just know that there are those roles within application services. Um, there's a business group manager. Um, business group manager, as we said, was, was king of the business group, a subdivision of the tenant. They can create and publish blueprints within the business group. Uh, they can also manage the catalog items and entitlements within their business group, and they can monitor the resource usage within their business group. So basically, they, they control what the business group can uh, deploy, um, how many of them they can deploy, um, and, and things like that. So there's quite a, a, a technical role, even though it says manager in it. Um, uh, just below the business group manager is support users who, as mentioned, they can request and manage uh, services on behalf of other users. Uh, then you have your approval administrator who is someone who can create and manage the approval policies. You have your approvers who can approve catalog requests and then your standard business user. Um, that's just a user that can be authenticated by the, by the identity source of the tenant and has uh, has been added to 
to the business group by the uh, either on the creation of business group or by the business group manager. Uh, and that is all of them, I think. Yep, that should cover everything. Awesome. Thank you very much for presenting today here and sharing your knowledge on this. Um, awesome demo. If people have any questions um, towards Sam, um, just use the questions box. I'll say we'll leave it open for another two, three minutes to see if there's any questions. Otherwise, um, we'll continue next week with uh, section three of the blueprint. So you're all invited to join us again. And um, we'll gladly take any feedback, um, either using the web form on professional uh, VMware.com or um, the uh, vbrownback uh, Twitter hashtag. So just just from your point of view, Sam, are you going to take the VCP6 CMA, or did you actually already take it? Uh, so I've, I've taken the, the VCP Cloud. Um, I think I probably will do the VCP6 CMA when I get a bit of time, um, just because the, there's a bit, a bit of other stuff that I probably need to learn more in depth about. Um, and also, I kind of want to make sure that I'm following the track um, for when the VCIXs are released so that I can upgrade uh, the VCDX to version 6. Uh, I think I just need to take the, uh, the design exam. So um, I've always wanted to keep the exams up, up to date just to, uh, well, I don't know why really. It's sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> You're preaching to the converted there. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't look like we've got any more questions on the line, so th thank you again for presenting. Uh, Thanks for having me. I'll, I'll see you folks uh, again next week. Bye-bye all.